Okay? And we've been on that subject for, for quite a while here in the book of Proverbs, and that's still the subject as we come to verse 15. And so it says, By me, by wisdom, kings reign, and rulers decree what is just. I feel blessed whenever the United States has leadership that, that knows Christ in a personal way, whether it's a president or whoever it might be. Because according to the Word of God, God will give leadership skills and the skills to judge correctly if somebody lives for Him. And so if it's a president, whoever it might be, will draw close to God he will give that person leadership skills. And boy, do we need that desperately. It's not always the politically correct way to be, but it's the best thing for our country. Verse 16. By me, princes rule, and nobles govern the earth. And there it is again. The, the ability to lead and the ability to judge, that is a byproduct product of a close relationship with Christ close relationship with God and you know people say don't judge and I touched on this Monday don't ju- or Sunday don't judge but I want to say are, are you out of your mind don't judge we have to judge we have to judge between right and wrong and hopefully the people in leadership are judging between right and wrong and making policy based on right and wrong and we have to judge between the guilty and the innocent. And Lord have mercy on us if we don't judge. And a life with Christ, a close walk with the Lord, gives us that, that skill to be able to discern these things. Verse 17. God says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. If you walk with Christ... If you have a close walk with the Lord, and that's, that's something that each and every one of us are cultivating, and it's a never-ending quest to draw closer and closer to the Lord. And it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. But if you, if you walk with Christ, you're going to feel His love for you. And I think the longer you walk with Christ, and the more you're in the Word, and the more you're in prayer, the easier it is for you to feel that love for Him, or that, that love for you that He has. But I do know if you walk with Christ, you're going to feel that, that His love for you. And uh, that's one of the neat byproducts of being a Christian. If you're sold out to the Lord, you really never lack affection. You don't feel unloved. Not if you walk with the Lord. You know, maybe there's nobody in this whole world that loves you. But if you have a close walk with the Lord, you know that God loves you. And you feel it. The closer your walk is with Him, the more you feel it. Verse 18, Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and prosperity. Notice the enduring wealth. Now, God may or may not bless you with wealth in this life. That's up to Him. But if you walk with Christ and you live for God, the Bible is clear here, you're going to have enduring wealth. And enduring wealth is talking about your rewards in heaven. I think you're going to be shocked. You live for the Lord in this life. I don't think we have a clue what is in store for us when we get, it, get into heaven as far as eternal rewards. But we will, we will have e- enduring wealth that will become apparent to us when we get to heaven. Verse 19. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield is than choice silver. And so walking in wisdom, walking in a close relationship with God, that will give you spiritual and moral character. And that spiritual and moral character that a life with Christ provides is worth more than silver and it's worth more than gold. It's worth worth more than any kind of wealth. It yields a better return, God says. Verse 20. I walk in the way of righteousness and the paths of justice, endowing with wealth those who love me and filling their treasuries. God says, 
concerning wisdom, I walk in the way of righteousness and in the path of justice. People need direction today. We all need direction today. Day to day living, moment by moment living. Close walk with Jesus will provide you with guidance. And you'll be able to walk in the path of righteousness, like he says here. Walk in the path of justice. Because God the Holy Spirit will be leading you. Now, you may not even hear his audible voice. You may not even hear his still small voice. But he will be guiding you as a byproduct of you just being in a close relationship with God. It just happens. Verse 22. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work. The first of his acts of old. And remember this. I've talked about this several times in the last few weeks. But when you talk about wisdom in the Bible, you're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because all the treasuries of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ Jesus, the Bible says. And so Jesus is the personification of wisdom. So anytime you have wisdom in the book of Proverbs, you can just put little parentheses around that word if you want to and write in the word Jesus because it applies. And notice what he says here in verse 22. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. The Father has never existed without the attribute of wisdom, and the Father has never existed without the Son either. That is one thing about God. I don't care if you're talking about God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. One of their attributes is this. They're they're immutable. They don't change. They are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And and, And they're eternal. Everything about God the Father is eternal. Everything about God the Son is eternal. Everything about God the Holy Spirit is eternal. They don't change. And so the eternal Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the eternal Son of the eternal Father. He's always been the Son of God. Now there was a time when He didn't have His physical body before the Incarnation, but He's always been the eternal Son of the eternal Father. And that's what this is talking about here in verse 22. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of His work, the first of His acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. Jesus was set up before the world was even created. Meaning this, He was appointed to be the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world long before time as we know it even began. That just kind of boggles my mind when I think about that kind of stuff. You know, because my mind only goes back so far. And I wonder how long an eternity past it was when Jesus and the Father planned out the plan of salvation and decided that there would be there would be a human race and there would be a planet Earth and there would be sinners on there who needed to be saved and there would be a nation Israel who needed a Messiah and everything. You know, he and the Father were planning this thing long before there even was a universe. And amazing. Look at twenty four. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world. When it says, don't, when it says uh, brought forth, don't take that to mean that the Son of God was at some point created. That's not what it's talking about. Remember, this is, this is poetic language here, and it's poetic language just meant to do, uh, describe the distinction between the Father and the Son. Look at 27. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, And, of course, that's talking about creation week. And what the Bible is saying is that Jesus was right there, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, during creation week. They were together. And you know who else was there? The holy angels. The book of Job talks about how the angels were there in creation week, watching everything come together and just shouting, shouting, shouting for joy. I can just, can't you just see that? Every time God created something, he just said, let there be light, and the angels would just erupt in applause. And every single day, they just shouted with excitement. It, was, it must have been such a thrill to see everything come together. And so Jesus was there, 
And the Father was there. Jesus was more than there. Look at verse 30. Then I was beside him like a master workman. That's Jesus talking. He said, I was beside the Father like a master workman during creation week. The Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know if you guys knew this or not, He is, he is or He was, the active agent during creation. Jesus is the one. He was the master craftsman of creation. Jesus was the craftsman of creation. He's the one that put it all together. And the New Testament teaches that too. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 3. says, All things were made by Christ, or all things were made through Christ, and without Him wasn't anything made that was made. Everything was made by Jesus. So, that has always just thrilled me too, to think of that little baby that came into the world was actually the one who created everything. In the last part of verse 30, And I was daily His delight, rejoicing before Him always. Boy, that gives you, that gives you a little bit of an insight into a relationship between the Father and the Son. I was daily His delight. Notice that. The Father and the Son delighted in each other. The Father and the Son have loved each other with an infinite love that has always existed. For eternity past, they have delighted in one another. And we can't possibly imagine what that relationship is like. We cannot possibly fathom how deep the love is between the Father and the Son. How perfect it is. But you know, you can take, take, the, take the love that you have for the one that you love the most and multiply it times infinity. And then maybe you'd be able to scratch the surface of how much the Father and the Son delight in each other and love each other. Then, though, think about how hard it would be to watch that person that you love so much die a brutal death at the hands of sinners. Imagine that. And then I think if you can just begin to imagine that, you can just about maybe scratch the surface of what the crucifixion did, not just to Jesus, but to His Father. That that must have been tough. 31. Notice this. Still talking about the Father rejoicing in His inhabited world. God was rejoicing in the earth when it was being created. And He still rejoices in it. And this is amazing to me because you think out of out of everything in the vastness of this whole universe, isn't it amazing to you that God would get so much delight out of planet Earth? And when you stop and think about it, because it is so small on the backdrop of the universe that it scarcely even qualifies as a speck. And yet, in this big old universe, God says He delights in this world something else last part of verse 31 rejoicing in this inhabited world and delighting in the sons of men and so God delights in this little planet this little speck but he also delights in man which is a real credit to God's forbearance and his ability to love what is unlovable because every single one of us have turned our back on him we've all sinned against him And yet he still delights in this planet and he still delights in man. Think about that. God hasn't just created you. He doesn't just love you. He delights in you. He likes us. Isn't that amazing? When you consider how many times we offend him, every single one of us. Verse 32. And now, my sons, listen to me. Happy are those who keep my ways. And there is no joy like the joy that comes from being obedient to Christ and therefore being able to fellowship with Him. And it is, it is a happiness, a deep happiness that we have when we know Christ and we walk with Him. Something that nothing in this world can possibly 
come close to given us. Verse 33, Hear instruction and be wise, and do not neglect it. Two commands here. Hear and don't neglect. It's good to take in the Word. It's good to read the Word. Good to listen to the Word. But God is saying, take in the Word and also live it. He gives us two commands here. And the second one is to not neglect His Word. And so if we just take in the Word and then we neglect to do the Word, then we rob ourselves out of a blessing in the process. It won't do us any good. Verse 34. Happy is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who misses me injures himself. All who hate me love death. All who hate me, wisdom says, or Jesus says, love death. That's the only conclusion that you can come to. That's the conclusion that God comes to. It all comes down to Jesus and what we do with Him. That's what it boils down to. If you find Jesus, the Bible says here, you find life. If you find Him, you find life. But if you reject Him, if you miss Him, if you reject Him, God says you must love eternal death. You love death. Because that is what you choose when you choose to reject Jesus. Chapter 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up her seven pillars. Stop right there for a second. The seven pillars of wisdom refer to the sevenfold description of wisdom that God gives us. John, or yeah, John chapter 3, verse 17. James chapter 3, verse 17. God describes wisdom in seven ways. He says, The wisdom that is from above is first of all pure, then it is peaceable, then it is gentle, then it is willing to yield, and it is full of mercy, it is without partiality, it is without hypocrisy. You put all those things together. That is God's definition of wisdom. James chapter 3, verse 17. That would be a good scripture to look up and pray every single day for yourself. Lord, Give me wisdom. Help me to be pure. Help me to be peaceable. Help me to be gentle. Help me to be willing to yield. Help me to be full of mercy. Help me to be without partiality. Help me with, to be without hypocrisy. Boils down to this. Something we have been studying since we started the book of Proverbs. When you talk about wisdom, you're talking about the character of Jesus Christ. You're talking about the person of Jesus Christ. And of course, you just saw a sevenfold description of Jesus Christ, haven't you? That's exactly how he was and is. But it boils down to this. Wisdom, the foundation of wisdom is this godly character. Two. Talking about wisdom now as a woman, she has slaughtered her beast. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her maids to call from the highest places in the town. And so wisdom, God portrays wisdom here in these two verses as a very wealthy lady who builds a big house and she puts together a feast and sends out her servant girls to invite anybody who is interested to come to this feast and just enjoy herself. God is offering wisdom and joy to anybody who is interested in receiving it. That's his point here. The invitation is going out to everybody. She has made a party for you. She has established a feast for you. If you want it, you can come and get it. This is The way of God is the way of wisdom. And the way of wisdom is the way of holiness. And the way of holiness is the way of joy. And wisdom here is inviting us to come and have joy. Verse 4. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who is without sense, she says... Come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave simpleness and live and walk in the way of insight. Leave simpleness and live. Leave simpleness and live. Simple-minded people, remember in the Bible, are people who are naive and gullible and easily influenced and easily 
led astray, very inexperienced. The wisdom that God gives, just from reading His Word, will include a strong moral compass. And that strong moral compass will keep you out of a lot of jams and keep you out of a lot of trouble and keep you from acting foolishly. And that's what He's offering here. Leave simpleness and live. Walk in the way of insight. Seven. He who corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. And he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. God is saying that the measure of a person's character can be seen. The measure of a person's character is seen in how he handles rebuke and correction when he does something wrong. He says a wicked man, a wicked man won't respond very well to correction. A wicked man will get angry when they are corrected. But a, a wise person, somebody with a godly heart, will say thank you for that correction. See? The measure of a person's character is seen in how they handle correction. A wise person will say, thank you for that correction. It wasn't much fun. Nobody likes being corrected. Nobody likes being told that they're doing something wrong. Didn't enjoy it. But I thank you for it anyway because it's going to make me a better person. God says, that's a wise person. We all need correction. Every single one of us do. That's why we all need each other. And a wise person receives it and doesn't take it personally, doesn't get angry. Verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. And so, if we are godly, and therefore wise, just like he said in the previous verse, we're not going to resent criticism. We'll receive it, and we'll become even wiser as a result of it. In other words, if you're a wise, godly person, you're going to see correction as being a blessing. Maybe not a pleasant one, but a blessing nevertheless. You'll see it as a, a, a blessing and a means of increasing the supply of wisdom that you already have. And so the wise get wiser. Verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is inside. And that's where it all begins. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And after that, there's a chain reaction. That is the most important thing in the world is to have a good, healthy, respectful fear of God because that starts a positive chain of reaction. Chain of reaction. Respectful fear of God, you know what it's going to cause you to do? It'll cause you to read the Word of God with a humble spirit. And when you read the Word of God with a prayerful, humble spirit, that's going to result in you knowing God better. And as you get to know God better, then His knowledge is going to rub off on you just from spending time with Him. And you're going to be smarter and wiser than you ever have been. See the chain of reaction? But it all begins, you see, with a respectful fear of God. That is why ch parents don't do their children any favors at all when they don't discipline them and teach them to respect authority. Because if they respect their parents in the home, then they're more likely to grow up respecting the authority of God as well. And parents need to teach their children to respect the authority of God. From the time that they are old enough to learn how to learn, you know, respect God. Verse 11. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years will be added to your life. Remember by definition what a proverb is. A proverb is a general truth. And so what this verse is saying is this. In general, if you live a godly life, in general, you're going you're to live longer than somebody who you know, goes around doing all sorts of foolish and unbiblical things. Verse 12. If you, I like this verse. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. In other words, it is in your own best interest to be a godly person. You're helping yourself more than anybody else. It's in your own best interest to be a godly person. 
you're going to benefit from your godliness more than anybody else. Now, if somebody chooses to scoff at the word of God, well, others may be hurt by their ungodliness to a point, unfortunately, since we don't live on our own individual islands, you know, and our lives touch everybody around us. If somebody chooses to live an ungodly life, it's going to have a negative effect on other people around them to a point. But in the long run, they're going to be the big loser. The person who chooses to be ungodly. Verse 13. A foolish wisdom, a foolish wisdom, a foolish woman is noisy. She is wanton and knows no shame. And here you see the kind of woman that God does not approve of. This kind of woman that does not appeal to God. A noisy woman, a flirting woman, a loose woman. She's a foolish woman as far as God is concerned. Verse 14. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the high places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. Nothing gracious about this lady, according to God. Nothing ladylike, according to this lady, or according to God either, about this. Nothing ladylike about a woman like this, I should say, according to God. Very pushy. She's out to seduce men who are easily influenced. Look at verse 16, last part of it. And to him who is without sense, she says, stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Stolen water is sweet. See what she's doing? She's the type of person that appeals to the sinful nature of man. Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. When sinful man knows when sinful man knows that he can't do something, oftentimes that stirs up his desire to do it even more. It's what the Bible teaches. Not in every case, not with every person, but as a general rule, that's the way the human race is. Because of our depravity, we have a natural bent toward rebellion as human beings. Rebellion against God. And Paul even talks about it in the book of Romans, chapter 7, 7 and 8. You can read it sometime. Romans 7, 7 and 8. You tell somebody that they can't do something. You make a rule saying you can't do something. It immediately, if nothing else, starts stirring up curiosity in a sinful person. You know, I wonder what it would be like to do that. You know, it kind of intensifies the desire. You maybe even never thought about doing it before, but all of a sudden you're told that you can't do it. I said, hmm. I find that interesting. And so a woman like this appeals to the depravity of man. She says, come on. They say it's wrong. And so that will make it even more exciting. Let's just go ahead and do it, whatever it is. Let's do it. Verse 18. But she does not, or he does not know that the dead are there. That her guests are in the depths of Sheol. And what God is saying is, somebody like this doesn't give you both sides of the story. She doesn't say, oh, yeah, by the way, you ought to know that following this brief moment of pleasure you're going to have a lifetime worth of regret that is exactly the way Satan is isn't it entices you to sin shows you the good part you know the the fun part of sin but doesn't tell you how short lived that is going to be and never tells you about the consequences that are on the other side of that that are going to last probably for the rest of your life that is one thing I love about the word of God and about the book of Proverbs. We, we have a choice. We can gain so much wisdom without the negative experience that normally goes along with accumulating wisdom over the years if we just read the Word of God. You can have the wisdom of an older person when you're a young person if you just take in the Word of God and believe it. We can learn the easy way by reading and believing the Word or we can learn the hard way by sinning and then regretting the foolishness that we did for the rest of our lives. Chapter 10. The Proverbs of Solomon. Proverbs of Solomon. You might find this interesting. In the Hebrew language, every letter of the Hebrew alphabet 
has a numerical value. Okay? So, you can take your name, write it down in Hebrews, and find out what, num- what numerical value your name has. Solomon, the numerical value of Solomon's name is 375. Do you know how many Proverbs there are in this section of the book of Proverbs that says the Proverbs of Solomon? 375. How about that? I love that when God does stuff like that. Look at verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. God says that a son, by the way he lives, can either make his parents miserable or he can make his parents joyful. It all depends on whether that son lives for God or doesn't live for God. Verse 2. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. A holy life oftentimes delivers people from death. Again, I don't know how many times God has said this in the book of Proverbs, because it keeps a person away from doing foolish things that the ungodly do and dangerous things that the wicked do. Just one of the great byproducts of walking with the Lord. Verse 3. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. God thwarts the craving of the wicked. Sometimes the wicked have a lot more than the righteous. That's not always the case, but sometimes the wicked seem to be so successful. I suppose because maybe they don't have the scruples that a saved person would have. And so sometimes they may succeed more in this world. But God is saying he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Just when a wicked person thinks that he's obtained that thing that will give him satisfaction, he finds out that it doesn't. That is what this means. A lot of you people can probably testify to that if you came to Christ at an older age. Look at how many things you looked for. You tried to get satisfaction in And when you got it, it's like it slipped out of your hands. There was no satisfaction there. It wasn't what it promised to be. See, that's what God is talking about here. Fulfillment always slips out of the hand of people who don't know God because they're seeking fulfillment in everything and anything other than Jesus Christ. And it's just not going to be there. Verse 4. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. A slack hand. Talking about a lazy person. A lazy person or a careless person who's always horsing around and never applies himself to work hard. God says he's going to be poor. And that only makes sense. A person like that probably won't finish school. You know, and that's that's not a good start. He sure won't be able to keep a job because nobody's going to want him around if he's lazy. Result, poverty. Verse 5. A son who gathers in summer is prudent, but a son who keeps or who sleeps in harvest brings shame. A son who sleeps in harvest brings shame. And I suppose a father would just have to slap himself alongside the head and say, where did I go wrong? If he had a son like this, Where did I go wrong? Because you have to wonder about a son who would plow, plant, and cultivate all summer, but then to be too lazy to get out and harvest it in the fall. (laughs) There's something wrong with that. You'd be ashamed to show yourself in public if you had a son like that, I suppose. How's the crop? Well, I don't know. We never got out of the field. My son didn't want to get out of bed. Well, I saw him working in the hot sun for three months. Yeah, but he didn't feel like harvesting. Okay. Verse 6. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. The mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Abusive speech, that is hanging low inside the mouth of a wicked person. Abusive speech. Their tongue is like a vent for their soul. And a lot of hurtful things come out of the mouth of somebody who isn't walking with the Lord. 7. The memory of the righteous is a blessing, 
but the name of the wicked will rot. Pleasant memories of a righteous person go on and on and on long after that person is dead. Look at how many people are named after a family member that they loved who's passed away. Think about how, the, how many people are named in this country. Think about how many people are named Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Daniel, David. Why? Because the memory of a righteous person lives on. And we want to name our children after people like that. But notice what he says. The name of the wicked will rot. How many of you know somebody named Judas? I've never met anybody. I wouldn't even name my dog Judas. So, that's what God means here. Verse 8. The wise of heart will heed commandments. In other words, a wise person is going to pay attention to godly advice no matter who it comes from or where it comes from. A wise person will just discern good counsel and accept it. Even from a little brother or even from a little sister or even from a wife, or even from a husband, or whatever, a co-worker. Because they just love wisdom so much, and they'll take the advice no matter where it comes from. Last part of verse 8, But a pratting fool will come to ruin. Pratting fool. Somebody who talks way too much, but never listens. A pratting fool will come to ruin. And that's because they don't learn it's because they're always talking and not spending enough time listening. And the consequences of a life like, of life like that is chaos and trouble and ruin. And they never dig themselves out of a pit, it seems, because they're always talking and never listening. And it's really tough. Really tough. Like if I get a call to talk to somebody who's having trouble, and I'll spend a lot of time in prayer and a lot of time in word dealing with the subject and present to them a biblical response and to have them not listen you walk away just like I know it wasn't a waste of time because I did what God wanted me to do but it was a waste of time for them verse 9 he who walks in integrity walks securely but he who perverts his way will be found out if you walk in integrity you're going to walk securely meaning this you're going to feel secure. You're going to have a sense of peace. That is something that a walk with God will give you. A sense of security. A sense of peace. But if you, if you live a deceptive life, you can't have peace that way. It's impossible. You have to worry about being exposed. And eventually you will be exposed. Verse 10. First part of it, and then I stop. He who winks the eye causes trouble but he who boldly reproves makes peace he who winks the the eye causes trouble this is talking about